I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Ray Bignall. Dr. Bignall is the founding chair of the ASN Healthcare Justice Committee. Dr. Bignall, welcome. Thank you so much, Todd, for having me on. Um, as we were launching the committee, you pushed hard for the name healthcare justice. Um, I was really thinking more along the lines of health disparities and health inequities, and, and you really focused in on justice. I'm curious as to why that was so important to you. Yeah, well, I appreciate you asking that question. Um, you know, I think that there has been an explosion of interest in health disparities and health inequities. Uh, over the course of the last year, uh, really accelerated by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and many of the health inequities that we see uh, that surrounds uh, that disease. Uh, but we've known about health disparities and health inequities for uh, a long time, certainly as long as we have had a profession of medicine. Um, I think that the power of focusing an entire committee's energy around these issues should not be relegated to a discussion of health inequities alone or health disparities alone. I think really there's tremendous power and opportunity for us as a profession to think about how we can move upstream. You know, by the time we see a disparity or an injustice, it's too late. And often correcting those concerns uh, prevents us from dealing with the problem further upstream. The root of all of these disparities and inequities that we see in healthcare is injustice, whether that is an injustice in how medical care is being delivered, or an injustice in how patients are being treated, or an injustice in the society and social conditions that our patients live in with their disease condition, uh, our opportunity and our energies are best served by moving upstream and dealing with justice in a holistic way rather than dealing with its after effects in disparity and inequity. So, so your vision really is, is more of almost a systems engineering approach where looking at the the, the biggest picture possible, identifying what some of the manifestations of systemic racism have been, and then to try to address those from the perspective of, of both healthcare and then the kidney community. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that there is such an amazing um, focus today on issues of systemic racism uh, that have come out in the last year uh, even, um, while we know that there have been many working on these issues for decades, um, that there is a real uh, power uh, that is being brought to bear from the medical community today to deal with issues of systemic racism. And uh, just like the phrase suggests, uh, systemic racism uh, is embedded within the systems that we uh, use to deliver care to patients. And kidney health care is no different. So if we're not using this sort of a systems-based approach to dealing with uh, racial injustice that impacts patient care, uh, but also the other injustices that we see in society that often uh, intersect with racial injustice, things like uh, poverty and uh, income inequality, environmental injustice, et cetera, I think um, our opportunity to address the, in, the disparities and inequities that we see in kidney care are best served by taking this sort of whole systems approach. So as you think about the committee and as it gets started, what are, what are some of your priorities? What are areas that you really want to focus as quickly as possible? Yeah, so this is one of the cool things about being, and frankly intimidating things about uh, leading this committee. Um, I am on a committee that's made up of uh, superheroes in the world of kidney health inequity and kidney health disparities research and clinical practice. Uh, so it's just been a real treat to work with this diverse team of folks uh, who have representational identities that cross all aspects of pediatric nephrology. We have uh, ped uh, excuse me, um, pediatric and adult nephrology. We also have patients uh, who are represented on our committee as well, which is really awesome to have that perspective. 
And as you can imagine, as many people as there are on our committee, there are ideas <laughs> and priorities to address. Uh, so we, we, you know, sort of winnowing it down to a, uh, a handful of actionable priorities for us has been a real challenge. Um, I would instead think about the buckets, so to speak, where we are attempting to focus our energies. Uh, there have been some topics and themes emerging over the course of our, our first couple meetings uh, that we're using to help uh, hone our focus uh, around what tasks we could undertake to help address uh, health inequities and to help to achieve health care justice um, you know, with the, the work that our committee is doing. And recognizing that we can't boil the ocean, so to speak, uh, we want to make substantive progress in these areas. Uh, there is wide agreement that we need to be doing a better job recognizing health disparities and uh, creating systems to be able to address and eliminate them. Uh, this is a massive, massive undertaking. And certainly the ASN's HCJC is not the only group working on this. There are uh, thousands of researchers, clinicians, kidney health professionals who are tackling this problem within kidney disease, and thousands and thousands more tackling this problem in a host of disease conditions uh, around the country. But if we want to help address this as a committee, we have been looking to develop specific criteria that could include, for example, um, uh, driving more research and discovery into not only the causes of health inequities, but those upstream drivers that are causing them and developing solutions for those upstream drivers. We're, we're eager to work with uh, pharmaceutical industries and business and academic institutions to develop approaches that would allow us to unify our response to dealing with health inequities. We would even love to see more scholarship in this area, uh, published in some of our venerable journals like Jason, C. Jason, and Kidney360. So w we're really excited about exploring health inequities in that manner. But I think another area that has got us really excited is the opportunity for education and community engagement. You know, we really see the HCJC as a committee that's focused outside of our profession. We are fortunate to be part of such an amazing professional society, the ASN, uh, that does such great work to support our colleagues in nephrology here in the United States and around the globe. Uh, what we see as the vision for this committee is a complementary and parallel vision where we can help utilize the strengths we have as a diverse team of kidney health professionals to provide education and community engaged uh, resources that will help to advance the issues of kidney health equity uh, and help teach both our colleagues and our communities how we can work together to bring justice to the care that we provide our patients with kidney disease. So, so you've covered a lot there. And what I'm struck by is that you've really delineated it in terms of there are opportunities in terms of improving care. There are opportunities in increasing and promoting research. Um, there's also the entire continuum from undergraduate medical education to graduate medical education to continuing education. And then finally, there's the support pe for people throughout their careers. Happy to go in any of these directions. Um, if you'd like, um, what would be your preferences to where to start as we kind of dig down a little bit? You know, I think that one of the areas where we need probably the most attention that has been sort of the most untouched has been in the educational space, both educating providers of patients with kidney disease uh, educating our communities, particularly those communities that suffer a disproportionate burden of kidney disease, recognizing kidney disease, understanding it, understanding the therapies that are being given, being given strategies for better advocating for themselves. Uh, but I think there's also an, a special need for us to do a better job 
educating medical students, residents, uh, trainees, uh, specifically fellows in nephrology, on how to recognize health disparities, how to recognize the drivers of health disparities, and how to address disparities in their clinical practice. Um, oftentimes, that starts with something as simple as appreciating the biases that all of us, regardless of our background, regardless of our race, our gender, um, our uh, place of origin, uh, nation and nationality, uh, the biases that we all carry with us into that clinical space. Um, and then learning how to, when once we identify those biases, mitigate them so that the care that we provide is far more equitable across the board. And the same way that we can do that as individuals, we should be looking at how we can do that as uh, care teams. You know, whether that be a, a small uh, private practice nephrology group with a handful of nephrologists, uh, or it's a large academic medical center with nephrologists and allied health professionals working together, uh, we, we really should do a better job educating ourselves on issues uh, both in society and in clinical practice that threaten health equity uh, and healthcare justice. And to that point, I've heard a couple of, of nephrologists, including the current ASM president, Dr. Suk Wagon, make the point that one potential way to start to accomplish what you're recommending is to increase the exposure that medical students and residents have to people with kidney diseases, to people with kidney failure, to the transplant community um, as a way to start to, to expand sort of their understanding of, of some of the health disparities that this patient population faces. There's a unique opportunity here. I'm just curious if that's something that the committee has discussed or if that's an idea that, that you've heard from other perspectives. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is one area that the committee is unified in, is trying to um, increase our uh, exposure to one another, r really to develop more uh, empathetic uh, uh, approaches to providing clinical care. Uh, you know, I I'm struck by this phrase that came out of the disabilities rights movement uh, around the time when President George H.W. Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, and the phrase is, nothing about us without us. Uh, this idea that uh, if we are going to provide solutions to complex problems that affect individuals living on the margins of society or the margins of clinical care, that we necessarily must include them in the process of developing those solutions. It's one of the reasons why it was a priority for our committee to have robust representation of individuals who themselves have kidney disease uh, and those who are not only physicians uh, in the American Society of Nephrology, but also nurses, social workers, uh, and, and others who are able to bring unique lenses to how we diagnose, uh, how we treat, kidney disease, how we uh, explore, uh, you know, new discoveries for therapeutics, uh, and how we can better educate our field and our communities in order to help narrow these uh, really troubling health disparities that we see affecting communities on the margins. You know, it's interesting that you'd mentioned the Americans with Disabilities Act, and of course that went into effect in 1990, or it was passed in 1990. Five years earlier, um, the Reagan administration commissioned a report and the HHS secretary, the Department of Health and Human Services secretary at the time was was Margaret Heckler. So it's known as the, the Heckler Report. And it was the report on the secretary's task force on black minority health. And there's a series of recommendations there. Many of those recommendations um, were never enacted. And in fact, um, the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, sort of reissued, if you will, many of the same recommendations um, in the late 1990s. A big part of the report was focused on the research agenda. Uh, the person, one of the, the people who was key to the, to the task force was the deputy director of NIH at the time. And there were a lot of recommendations to NIH that were never enacted. Can you help us understand why 
kind of the research enterprise has been slow, so slow to respond to the need for research in this arena? You know, I think that there is a confluence of challenges that result in the research enterprise, and, and we can include uh, business, um, uh, industry, we can include the pharmaceutical industry, uh, device manufacturers and academic institutions all um, yeah, in this critique. Um, I think that there is a, a confluence of reasons why this group has been slow to adopt uh, measures that would help to bring about increased equity. Um, and it boils down to the fact that it's hard work. <laughs> uh, it may be harder than discovering a new medication or uh, inventing a new uh, dialysis device. Uh, and it's hard because it involves challenging our preconceptions, it involves engaging new groups of people, and it involves having really difficult conversations uh, in spaces where we are all collectively uncomfortable. So, you know, one of the the things that I hear all the time when it comes to medical research in particularly the African-American community here in the United States is, oh, well, the reason that black Americans don't want to be involved in medical research is because of Tuskegee and the experience of the Tuskegee syphilis uh, study. And of course, this um, serves as a tremendous foundation for why many individuals within the black community here in the United States are hesitant to be engaged with research or uh, hesitant to um, engage with the healthcare community in general. But I think that there are so many more contemporary examples of small injustices that happen in the lives of black Americans every day that make them very, very hesitant to participate in these kinds of unusual projects, whether it be signing up to participate in a research trial or sometimes even just going to a new physician with whom you don't have a relationship. And what I try to remind people about is we do ourselves a disservice as a community of healthcare providers if we are unable to acknowledge the very real history and, in fact, the ongoing experiences of black Americans and brown Americans and other people in the United States who've experienced injustice at the hands of the medical establishment. Um, part of the best way to address these challenges is just to be upfront with folks. You know, one of my favorite stories about addressing these difficulties and getting families and patients to uh, be part of research and, and uh, clinical innovation, particularly families uh, from minority backgrounds. One of my favorite stories uh, involves the family of a patient that I have with nephrotic syndrome, a, a young lady, um, a school-aged child who uh, had really difficult to treat nephrotic syndrome. And I was seeing her for the first time, taking over from another provider who had left our practice. And just before I had gone in the room, some members of our team at Nationwide Children's had uh, registered her for uh, one of our uh, research trials, the Cure GN study, for those of you who are familiar. And, and you know, this is a really important uh, study for us to be able to better understand glomerular disease. And we want to see uh, more African-American patients uh, like this patient uh, participating in studies like this so that we can better understand how these diseases affect many different patient populations. And so it was great that they that our team was signing this child up for the study, but the family was really, really resistant. And eventually they agreed before I walked in the room, but the nurse kind of came to me and said, Dr. Ray, just want to let you know, this family is not happy. <laughs> so I sort of went in the room already primed for a difficult conversation. And I introduced myself to the family, two black parents of this beautiful black girl. And I said to them, I know that you have some concerns about being a part of this research study. And I'm thankful that you have signed up. I 
want to know more about what your concerns are. But before I tell you that, I want to just share one thing with you. And I told them that they were right to be worried about signing their child up for a research study, that they were right because there is a very real history of injustice that's been perpetrated upon communities of color by individuals in the medical establishment. And that even me, as an African-American man, understands what it feels like to have a family member who has been mistreated because of the color of their skin. And I acknowledged that fact and I made them a promise. I said, I want to promise you that as long as I am your child's doctor, no one will ever touch your child or ask your child to be a part of any research study unless I am confident that I can help to keep them safe. And you know, I said those words to that, those parents and they both broke down crying in the room. And it was an incredible experience because for the first time, they felt as though they were seen. Their concerns were heard and understood that they didn't have to protect this child from the doctors and that there was a doctor who was going to help protect their child too. I think that's the approach that we should all have in healthcare, that we should acknowledge the very real history of injustice that many of our communities experience and that we should be willing to say to our patients and to their parents and caregivers, we get it. We know and understand where you're coming from. We also acknowledge that this is true. It has happened before and it happens today. And as long as I am your doctor, your child's doctor, I'm going to do my best to make sure that you're cared for in an equitable fashion and in a fashion that, uh, that leaves you feeling uh, like you've had a positive experience in our care. Thank you for sharing that story with us. As I'm reflecting on what you just said, I'm, I'm struck that while there are things that organizations like ASN can do, and of course we have both a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee and now the healthcare justice committee, at the end of the day, it's it sounds like the, the most important thing is that we as an organization and individual institutions need to do everything they can to both educate their health professionals and um, tell them this history and help those that don't know it um, know it, but also this this one-on-one communication with patients and their families. And I hadn't really thought of it in that way, that it's, it's, it's just such a broader set of communications and, and issues around building trust that, that you, even if ASN did everything right, it wouldn't matter if, if things didn't happen at a local level. Um, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm sort of expressing that correctly. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I think you've really touched on what the mission of the ASN HCJC is all about. We know that health equity will not be achieved in patients with kidney disease until every single kidney health professional has health equity as a priority in the care that they are discharging to patients and to families of individuals who have kidney disease. And so what we want the HCJC to be about is to provide tools, concrete tools, whether that be through provider and community education, whether that be through developing robust relationships uh, with business, uh, academia, and pharmaceutical uh, organizations that uh, allow us the opportunity to help um, impact the policies that th- that in turn impact our patients, uh, or if it's developing some practical applications for clinicians, uh, new research opportunities, uh, a, a, a better um, uh, outreach structure and strategy for communities on the margins. We want to provide tools for kidney health professionals to be able to uh, seek justice in the health care that they provide their patients, to help mitigate the disparities that we see uh, that are such a burden to communities that are already burdened by so many other things happening in society today. Uh, Our hope is that over the next few months, we will have developed a really concrete and specific suite of 
uh, what we're describing as deliverables. Uh, hopefully some uh, tools that uh, the members in our uh, ASN family can utilize to be able to you know, seek healthcare justice in the care that they're providing their patients, whether they're providing that care in a large academic institution or they're a solo nephrologist in private practice. And, and we're, we're really excited about the opportunity that we have to partner with some of our uh, business and, and pharmaceutical friends uh, who are also interested in addressing health disparities uh, in the care that, that they're providing and facilitating through some of the amazing innovations that they have in the pipeline. At this moment in time, the kidney community is focused on an issue around the fact that um, there is a, a race coefficient in, in terms of how we assess kidney diseases. And there's a task force that, that's jointly um, formed by ASN and the National Kidney Foundation. They've, they've issued an interim report. Um, the organizations have, have both um, articulated several times that, that race is a social construct, not a biological construct. Um, there's a move toward removing the, the, the coefficient from, from the equation and then you know, identifying in all likelihood sort of a strategy for moving forward and, and addressing this issue. And I think it'll be a real model as we look at similar approaches in other parts of medicine. Can you help for those that, that may not be part of the kidney community or those that, that that don't think about these issues as much as they should. Can you help us understand why that issue has become so important, particularly for medical students and residents? Yeah, I, I have become so incredibly inspired by this generation of medical students and residents who are coming up and actively questioning uh, the way that we have been practicing medicine for decades. Uh, and Sometimes it's the easiest and simplest of questions that uh, helps to give some of the best, uh, the best responses. You know, um, at its core, we, we understand that uh, these, that there are so many like really complex uh, questions and challenges when understanding the, you know, uh, statistical significance of uh, the um, the use of race modifiers in the estimate of kidney function, whether or not that translates to a clinical significance. In fact, there may be substantial clinical significance that's unintended uh, when we consider all of the ways in which the use of the race modifier in estimating equations for kidney function could result in patients, and in fact has resulted in patients uh, being uh, delayed kidney care in ways that can be quite substantial. And it's really been this new generation of medical students and residents who have started to actively question and challenge, really push back on our use of race in medicine in this fashion. You know, race is a social construct. There is no biological basis for race. Uh, race is what we as a society uh, ascribe to individuals who share a variety of physical characteristics. But what we understand about biology is that we are so way more complicated than what we look like on the outside. And uh, I think that approach to appreciating the fact that the difference in what we look like on the outside versus what makes us up on the inside is at, its, is at the core, rather, of understanding why so many, myself included, are really frustrated with the use of race in medicine, particularly the use of these um, uh, race modifiers and estimating equations for kidney function. You know, I, I tell people uh, when I give talks about this um, all the time, I say, look, um, I'm not saying that uh, race, uh, a study and appreciation of race has no place in medicine. Uh, quite the contrary. You know, we've spent so much time already talking about racial and ethnic disparities in care. We're talking about the fact that there are certain racial groups in the United States that, and frankly around the world, uh, that receive substandard uh, care and uh, care that is less equitable than other groups. So race totally exists 
in medicine. And there's totally a place for understanding it and studying it and appreciating it. However, when we begin to ascribe biological significance to race, we enter very, very murky waters. Uh, and I think we should appreciate the fact that it's not race that places patients at risk for kidney disease, but it's racism. It's the way that race intersects with society in all of its complexities and ugliness that results in racial disparities in care. It's the reason why we know that you can control for all kinds of other socioeconomic um, variables for a variety of different kidney diseases, and still race is the most significant predictor. And it's the reason why we need to explore avenues for addressing health care from a justice perspective in the same way that we explore avenues for addressing health care from a biological perspective. Because if we really want to eliminate um, uh, disparities in kidney care, we have got to start to think bigger about our role as nephrologists. And, and I think that that's really at the core of what these medical students and residents are asking us as a society and as a community of kidney health professionals to do. And I love to see it. I'm, I'm excited to, to see how it grows in the future. Well, Dr. Vignal, thank you for taking the time to talk today. And also, more importantly, thank you for taking the time to to establish and, and launch this important committee. And I should say that even though we focused um, solely on the Healthcare Justice Committee, um, these issues and this effort to address and, and confront and hopefully overcome systemic racism in nephrology goes across ASN and in each of the different elements. If we're thinking about planning for Kidney Week or the work of the journals or what we're doing from a policy perspective, um, our workforce initiatives, everything um, has to support this effort. And so just I can't thank you enough for, for being the one that agreed to lead it and everything you've done thus far. Well, thank you so much, Todd. And, you know, I, I just want to add one final thing. You know, one of the things that our committee is most excited about doing is actually partnering with other ASN committees and, and even other institutions and organizations, our partners in business and uh, in pharma, uh, to address the challenges that they may have in uh, providing more equitable care to uh, patient populations that are on the margins of society and those patient populations that are overburdened by health disparities. So we are excited to work with um, all of our ASN committee partners from research to quality to policy and advocacy to uh, the diversity and inclusion uh, committee, diversity, equity, inclusion committee, and everyone in between uh, to be able to address these real substantive challenges. And uh, I look forward to uh, having uh, some more exciting specific initiatives to announce uh, in the months ahead, uh, once our committee uh, has its work up and running. Well, you've issued the charge, um, and I have every expectation that that others in internally and within ASN and externally within other organizations um, and with other you know of our corporate partners and the rest of the community will come forward. So, again, thank you, and, and um, I look forward to working with you for the years to come. Thanks so much, Todd. Appreciate the opportunity.